Hear God speak through his perfect and inerrant word. The boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. Every year, his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a, a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, after this Christmas season, we still want to remember. We want to remember every day as we lead into this new year, 2019, by your grace. Lord, we want to remember Jesus. We want to remember that he's our hope. We want to remember that he's the only hope for this world that we live in. Your eternal promises are all yes and amen. Lord, I pray that you give Pastor Andy the power, wisdom, clarity to preach your word this morning. Show him Jesus. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's good to uh, be able to kind of close out 2018 with you all and... Uh, to be able to worship uh, and to, to begin the year worshiping God and to end the year uh, worshiping God together. And that's what we are called to be as his people. We are called to be worshipers of God. And so, as uh, Chad mentioned, we are wrapping up our series in Luke 2. We've been looking this month at Luke 2, specifically kind of preparing our hearts for Christmas and looking at the account of Jesus' birth in Luke 2. We've, we've really focused in on this idea that uh, Jesus' birth was announced as good news um, for all people. And so we've looked at how his birth was good news for the shepherds, humble, lowly people. And we've seen how Jesus' birth was good news um, for, jo for Joseph and Mary who were striving to be obedient to God and yet still needed a Savior, still needed God in their life in a different kind of way. And then we saw last week the, the good news for the devout, for Simeon and Anna, two of the most religious people who were in the temple. And yet Jesus' birth was good news even for religious people. And we need that same good news today no matter how religious we feel. And uh, as we continue on, as we wrap up Luke 2, we're going to see uh, Jesus, uh, as much as we think about Jesus in the manger at Christmas time, uh, Jesus didn't stay a baby forever. All right? And, and uh, Jesus had more to do than just to be born in a manger. And so I want to take this week and let's just look at how Jesus grew as a boy. All right? And what we're going to see is as we see who Jesus knew himself to be, uh, as he grew up, he, he kind of realized he knew who he was. And as he grew into that, uh, we can then look at his life and how he grew and realize, hey, that's what God wants to do in us. Right? That's what Jesus wants to do, do in us. The, the growth of Jesus as a boy and then as a man mirrors what God wants to do in growing us. And so we have a lot to learn for, from Jesus himself. As our Savior, 
and what he wants to do in us. It's not just us trying to do these things. I want to be clear about that. But it's when Jesus lives in us, we are, our lives are going to look like his. And that's what we're going to see this, this morning. Um, and so I want us to start. It all starts with this understanding of who Jesus knew himself to be. All right? And let's see in verse 49. If you have your Bibles, look at verse 49. We see clearly who Jesus, even at a young age, as a boy, understood himself to be. Why were you searching for me, he asked them. He's talking to his parents. As you can understand, if his parents haven't seen him, he's lost. It's understandable that they would be searching for him, right? They haven't seen him for three days. Why were you searching for me, he asked them. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? All right, so clearly here we see Jesus has this understanding that God is his father. Right? He knew that he was the perfect son of God in a different kind of way than any other human being. If you're a believer in Jesus, you know, you believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he is fully God and fully man. As hard as that is for us to get our minds around, Jesus was fully God. He came to earth as a baby. He's fully man, just like us in every sense. And so you know that as God and as man, Jesus is the only one who can save us. With all our faults, with all our failures, with all our sins, we need God to save us. And Jesus entered our world as a man to save us. And so as a result, we know that all the growth in our life that comes closer to, as we grow closer to God comes with this understanding of who Jesus is. And the question is, well, how are we going to respond to that truth, right? Yeah, we can believe it. But how is that going to then shape how we live, right? How are we going to let that play out in our lives? Are we letting it play out in our lives at all? Are we saying, yeah, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and he's God and man, he died on the cross for my sins, and then we live like it makes no difference in our life at all? Or, or what should that look like? And that's what we're going to see today. When we look at Jesus' life as a boy, we see what our lives should like, look like if we have Jesus in us. That's what we see. So the first thing I want us to, to notice here uh, Jesus, about Jesus' growth is a growth in grace. This is what God wants for us to experience. Just as Jesus grew and he had the grace of God on him, God wants us to live with this reality that God's grace is in our lives. All right? So one of, the, one of the areas that we often need to be reminded of is the fact that God has extended his grace to us. All right? Everything in this world, everything that Satan wants to do in our lives— wants us to, to live apart from that reality, right? So, for instance, every time you sin, every time you do something against God, you say a bad word, or you think a bad thought, or you lust, or you have greed, or whatever, right? Anytime you do that, Satan wants you to believe in that moment that God has left you, and he will never come to you again. You, your life, you can't have God in it because of those things you've done. That's what Satan wants you to believe. Right? Every time something in your life disappoints you, right? life lets you down. Maybe Christmas lets you down. Your interactions with your family lets you down. Right? Satan wants you to believe that your life is a failure because of your disappointments. Every time your life seems pointless, like, why am I even here? What is going on? What, what am I doing with my life? Satan wants you to believe that your life doesn't matter, and he just wants you to give up and just do whatever. Right? Just do whatever you want to in life. And our growing understanding of God and as Jesus uh, coming to us is that God's grace counteracts those lies with the truth, right? That God's grace means that those things are not true. So, for instance, with, with our sin, right? We know that because of Jesus and his grace applied to us, that our sin is not the final word. That he actually gives us new life and, new, and forgiveness in spite of this this guilt and feeling that we can't have God in our life. Right? That actually, God wants to turn our sin into to this new life that he wants to do in us. Right? Our sin actually leads us to him because we know we need him. Right? And then with his grace in our life, we know that uh, in our disappointments and when we feel like a failure, we actually have victory in Christ. Right? Because he has won the victory over our souls, over our hearts, and our life does matter. Right? That life is not just a big disappointment, that we have victory, that Christ is leading us ahead in this world towards an eternity with him. Right? And so all these momentary disappointments, 
They're just a part of God's plan accomplishing his good purposes for our lives. And then we see that his grace, when we know his grace, it reminds us that, hey, our lives really do matter. Like, Jesus died because our lives matter. Right? God loves you enough that your life matters enough to him that he would send Jesus into this world to begin with. That he loves us, that he has a purpose for our lives every day to, to let others know about who, how great he is. Right? So our life, your life, matters to God. And so we, we know this. We, we hear this idea of grace, but then we show, we, we, how does that apply to us? Well, first of all, we looked at Jesus lived under God's grace. And that seems weird to us, right? We think, well, Jesus is God. How can he live under God's grace? But look at verse 40. The boy grew up and became strong. So here we got Jesus growing up, right? Filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. Your translation may say God's favor was on him. Favor is another word for God's grace. It's just God chooses to do it, and we don't do anything to deserve it. God just chooses to give it to us, all right? And so the point is this. Look, as Jesus grew older, God's good purposes were being worked out in his life as a human being. Right? He was accomplishing his purposes. And no force on this earth could stop God from accomplishing his plan through Jesus. Nothing could. Because God's grace was greater than the things going on on this earth. Even the Roman Empire. God's grace was greater than that. And so... We see that this is grace. God is working for good in the life of Jesus as a human being. And the beautiful reality of the Christian life, if you are a Christian today, or any person who follows Jesus Christ, is that the grace that Jesus had, the favor of God on him, working out his plan and his purposes in this world, that applies to every single follower of Jesus. Right? We are the same. Like God gives us undeserved favor, even though we don't deserve it at all. We think, man, like we always have to make up whatever we're doing to God. No, God, when we follow Christ, that is enough. And he is working out your life for good. And so grace, this is an amazing thing because this is the grace that prophets prophesied about for thousands of years. Like they looked forward to it. And angels wished they could see it. The Bible tells us angels wish they could experience this kind of grace. It's an amazing thing, and we get to experience it in Christ. And God just wants us to, to wrap our minds around it and actually believe it. He wants us to believe it. He wants you to grow in this understanding of grace. Just like Jesus, as he grew as a human being, realized it. And so we realize, look, if we are in Christ and Jesus lives in us, he applies that same grace to our lives. And he gives us everything good that we don't deserve. Like, God does that for us. He does that for us. And so this means that when we realize it, it creates this new love for him in us, right? This greater trust, this greater belief in his promises that, that God gives us. Man, even though we don't deserve it, God's doing it, so I'm going to keep on believing. I'm going to keep on trusting him. We know that God is working for our good even when life disappoints us. And it's not turning out how we thought it would. It's God doing good in us. Even when our hearts don't feel it. The question is, will we believe it? Will we believe that, hey, Jesus experienced this. Jesus is me. I can experience this too. He's in me. And so this frees us to really live. right? When we really wrap our minds and grow in our understanding of God's grace to us, it frees us to, to live knowing that God is with us every step of the way. That no, no force of hell, no force of earth can stand in, in the way of God's plan for us as his people. Like, we can live. And so are you living your life regularly knowing, hey, God is with me. I don't have to doubt. I don't have to fear. I don't have to beat myself up over and over again. Like God has forgiven that. He has extended me undeserved favor. I want to live for him and, and leave those things in the past just as he has washed those away through the blood of Christ. And so we see, look, Jesus, as we look at his life growing, we see how he wants to bring God's grace to bear in our lives. He wants us to think on these things. To know God loves us and gives us his grace. Then we see also, secondly, that there should be, be this growth in a desire to know and obey God. Jesus grew, and Jesus grew in his understanding as a man of who God was in this world, right? Working, what he was doing. That's hard for us to think about, but um, because we think of Jesus as kind of like he's God, right? So he knows all things. He's omniscient. 
He knows everything. He has to. But we know that God, Jesus also humbled himself and became the form of a man. So God, Jesus chose to limit his self-knowledge, right? And so he experienced uh, the hurts, the pains, the trials, all those things of human beings just like we do. And so Jesus limited himself. So as a, a man, he had growth in his understanding of what God was doing in his life here on earth, right? There was growth that was happening. And so knowing who Jesus is uh, should move us to do the same, to want to grow in our understanding of what's God wanting to do in my life? What's God want me to know? How does God want me to live? What does he want me to do? All right? And I thought, when I first became a Christian, uh, even through, up through my teenage years, right, I thought, well, you become a Christian, and your growth as a Christian kind of goes like this, right? It's kind of like this steady, uh, you, you're, you're going up, maybe, maybe a little bit slower, maybe a little bit faster, but you're, it's a steady thing. But I've learned after... 38 years that it's done work that way. All right, it's more like this, and then up, and you know that's that's what that's what growth as a Christian looks like, right? But in general, it should be going up, it shouldn't be going down, right? And we should have this desire to be grown, and um, that's what we see happening in Jesus's life from the beginning of Jesus's life. His parents taught him to want to to grow in God, to obey God. Look at verse 41. Every year, his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, for the festival. All right, so the Passover was this celebration of what God had done in Israel. How he brought them out of Egypt uh, when they were in slavery. He rescued them. And so Israel was commanded to remember that and to worship God for what he had done. All right, and so every year we see, hey, th but there's nobody like standing over their shoulder saying, hey, you have to go. All right, they have to choose to obey God. And his parents did that. Like, they were teaching Jesus, hey, obey God, what he says to do. Worship him. Know him. And, but we also see it wasn't just Jesus' parents telling him what to do. He owned his, his own, own faith himself. Look at verse 43. He stayed behind in Jerusalem after his parents had left and gone home. Could you imagine? Right, you're 12 years old. You're in the city of Jerusalem. All these people have flocked there for this festival. Like, hundreds of thousands of people. It's a big city, right? And we're talking about twice the size of Lexington. And you're a 12 year old, you're just kind of wandering around on your own. Like, that's what Jesus was doing and because he wanted to grow in his faith. He wanted to grow in his understanding of who God was. He wasn't trying to be disrespectful or disobedient to his parents. Some people would be like, man, Jesus just flat out disobeyed his parents. He just, and his parents said, stay with me. And he, and he said, no, I'm not staying with you. Anybody ever experienced that? I was in Walmart this week, and I experienced it multiple times. Uh, and so we see, no, Jesus was not trying to be disobedient. In fact, he loved his heavenly father so much that he wasn't disobeying God. He just wanted to, or disobeying God or his parents. He wanted to be with God, right? His love for God superseded his love even for his parents. And so he had, he was like compelled to stay by God in his life. And then we see after three days of searching, they find him in the temple, and he's sitting there, sitting there talking with teachers, right? He's talking with the teachers of the law, the, the most religious people, people who are closest to God. He's listening to them and learning. He's interacting. He's asking them questions, and they were, are, are astonished at his answers, it tells us, because he, he's got this knowledge. He's already been growing in who God is, and uh, no. We don't know what he was born with and understanding versus how much he grew, but he knew he was growing in, in who God was in his life. And we know clearly just from looking at that, look, Jesus was in the temple because he wanted to study about God. He wanted to know God. He wanted to know God's word, the Old Testament, the scriptures, the law of what God had already given Israel. That's why he was there. He wanted to grow in his understanding and obedience to God as his father. And I want us to just take that in for a second. Because if Jesus, the perfect Son of God, God in the flesh, needed and wanted to study God's Word, how much more do we need it? Right? How much more should we want it and have this desire? Man, we need to know what God says. We need it. Desperately. And yes, he laid aside his omniscience, but he was still God in the flesh. Right? And he needed God's word for his life to live day by day. And we need God's word to live in our lives. We, we so easily just treat it flippantly. Like it's not really that important. We need it. We 
We need it. And so you may say, okay, well, yeah, I agree. I need the Bible. All right? well, I know I ought to be reading it. I ought to be needing it like this. And you may say, well, how, how can I, though? How can I do that? Well, first, look at, just let this passage go to your heart. Let it remind you that, man, there is more of God to be had in your life than, than what's there right now. There is more of God to be had. Know that where you are right now is not the end. And let this passage remind you that, man, I need, to, I, I need more of God. There's more of him I need in my life. And Jesus desired a more understanding of God, right? And if his spirit lives in you, then you have that desire in you. If you are a Christian and you say you follow Jesus, you love him, the same desire Jesus had for God is a part of you. Like, it is there. You just need to let God speak to that desire and awaken it and say, man, I want more of God in my life. This is why this isn't right in my life. Because God's not in it. Right? I need God there. And I need God over here. And so I want to press into him and seek him out. And then we see really practically from Jesus' life how that happens. right? How he grows in this. We see his example of what he did to make sure that he was going to grow in God. First, he intentionally set aside time to be in God's presence. Right? He could have just gone on back home and gone through his daily routine with his parents or whatever. What did he do? No, he... He intentionally went to the temple, which is where God's presence lived at the time. Right? We know, now know that God's presence is in us through the Holy Spirit. In, before Jesus came, God's presence was in, physically in the temple. All right? So Jesus wanted to be in God's presence. And he wanted to meet with God in his word. And he set aside time to be intentional about doing that. Right? So that, this tells us, look, we've got to stay with it. Right? And I know for the new year, it's, for me, it's, I've just kind of reevaluated my, my own spiritual discipline. Am I uh, setting aside the time like I need to uh, and prioritizing like Jesus did here? Like if Jesus had to do it, I need to do it because life gets busy. And just set aside time to, to spend with God in his word, prayer. And so this says, look, stay with it. Don't give up on it. Keep being intentional about it. Think on his love for you. And then we see also that, that Jesus, to continue growing, what did he do? He spent time with God's people, right? He, he interacted with the teachers of Israel, the people that could help him the most in growing in his love for God. And I can't tell you how many times in my life that I have been encouraged and challenged by other people who are seeking to follow Jesus. I, I, one of the most formative kind of times in my life was in college. And I, I was in a college group in a church in Lexington when I was in college. And um, these guys, man, they just loved Jesus. They did whatever could, they could to grow. And like 15 of them are in ministry now. And so these guys all around me, it, it, it just encouraged me. Hey, there's more of Jesus to be had in my life. And my life can, can look more like theirs because they're, they're further along, right? And we need that. Or we don't really know what, what it should be. We don't really know what we can learn. And so Jesus did that himself. He sought to ask questions of people. So if you have questions, don't think your questions are stupid. Ask people. Right? Every question about who God is and who Jesus is is worth asking. So you can understand it. You can understand him and know him. So are you spending this, this meaningful spiritual time conversations with other believers who are going to kind of move you forward in your faith? And are you doing that for others? Are you intentionally like pulling people alongside you and saying, hey, I want to help you know what this, what your life can be, even though mine's not perfect, but I'm further along. I've been a Christian longer, so I know I've seen what God has done. And I want to help you do that, too. Like, we all have a responsibility both ways to do that. And so, look, the, the truth is, look, when we come to grips with Jesus' identity, that he is the Son of God, and yet he wanted to grow, he wanted to know God, look, that desire as our Savior, as our Lord, that becomes a part of who we are, too. That we want that same thing. And so we, have a, a, we should have a growth in grace, a growth in a desire to know and obey God. And we see, last, we should have a growth in our understanding of God as our Father. We should have understanding of growth as God as our Father. Right? So uh, the fatherhood of God in our lives, our understanding of what that means, is essential if our lives are going to look like Jesus. Because Jesus knew without a shadow of doubt, of doubt that God was his father, and it changed how he lived. It changed right here. 
what he did, right? He was in the temple because he knew that he wanted to be with his father. And so if we really grasp this idea of God as our father, it'll change us. Look at verse 49 again. Why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? It was necessary for me to be in my father's house. And so it's interesting. Right before that, in verse 48, Mary comes up to Jesus. And she's like, man, we found you finally, right? And, and they were astonished. And they're saying, son, why have you treated us like this? Like they thought he was being disobedient. But he said, he said, your father and I have been searching anxiously for you. But the interesting thing is, no, Jesus says, no, I was in my father's house. And he's not trying to slap Joseph in the face and say, look, you're not my real dad. That's, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, no, his understanding was his greatest sense of identity was that God was his father. That was where his identity and his purpose and everything he did came from. And yes, Mary was his mother. And Joseph was his father in an earthly sense. But God, as his father, eternally, forever, was the, the, the thing that shaped his life. Right? And that's what God wants us to grasp. That we need to see God as the primary shaping influence in our life, even more than any family member or any friend. Like God is our father. We know him. And so Jesus knew God was his personal, real in his life, father. He knew him intimately. He knew him personally. And it's interesting. This is a radical idea at the time Jesus was alive. Because up to this point in the Old Testament, the idea of God as a father was only mentioned 14 times in 39 books of the Bible in the Old Testament. And every single time God was mentioned as a father, it was in like this generic, distant sense. Right? So like God was the father of the nation of Israel. Right? So it's kind of like... He's the founder, right? He's, but it's still distant. They don't really know him as their father. But now Jesus all of a sudden comes on the scene 60 times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus calls him this intimate name of his father. Like, he knows him in this personal way. He knows him. And he uses that phrase over and over again to communicate it. And here's the thing. For us as Christians, when we ask Christ, to come in our life, to rule our lives. The intimate, kind of personal understanding of God as Father that was true for Jesus is true for us. Okay? God wants you to have this personal walk with him as your Father, just like Jesus did. And that's what Christmas really is all about, right? Jesus coming to reconcile us to our Father. Right? We walked away from our Father. We don't know him. We don't know God. We're saying that we were... Lost in darkest night, right? That's what we were singing before. That's, we were lost. We don't know God. We don't even see him. But Jesus comes, and when we know Christ, now we know God. He's all we have. He is our personal God. And so we see that in 1 John chapter 3. Let me read what John says. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. We are children of God. And that's what Christ does for us. God has adopted us into his family when we've done nothing to, be, to deserve it. Right? In Christ, you are God's child. And all creation is, uh, as people, we are God's children. But here we are his personal children. We are in his family. So get this. Because he's our father, that means all true worship. If we're really going to worship God, if we're really going to live for God, it begins with this understanding that God is real to us as our Father. That He's real in our lives. And we know it. That's what's going to lead to real worship. That's going to, what's going to lead, to lead to a real Christian life. And that's what Jesus won for us. Like Jesus had to win this for us. When he went to the cross, he paid an immeasurable price so that we could be brought into God's family. If he did all that for us, why would God not want us to know him like this? Right? He wants, he desperately wants us to, to know him as our father. He went to the, to the death of his son on a cross to forgive our sins so that we could know him. So we could be brought to him. And that's why when Jesus in Matthew 6, on the, in the Lord's Prayer, how does he start it? He says, come to God like this. Our father who art in heaven. Right? Father. 
personal father. You're praying to God. It's a conversation. You know him. Our father. And there's so much intimacy in that statement. Yes, God is transcendent. Right? We're approaching God reverently. God is transcendent. And yet God is personal. And that's what we can know as Christians. And God, will, God is personal because he loves us so much that he would call us his children in spite of all our faults. In spite of whatever you've done in the past, God still calls you his child if you are in Christ. God loves you that much. And so this has huge implications for us and how we live when we understand it. Right? First, we, it means that God as a father is a good father to us. He's not too busy for you. God's not too busy for you in your life, whatever you have going on right now. God is not too busy for that. Right? That God is not a, a deadbeat, absentee, disinterested dad. He cares about what is going on in your life. And he wants his, his presence to affect what you're dealing with. Right? To, to change the outcome of how you respond to your life. And better yet, he always knows what is best for you. Like he's a father who wants to guide you through the ups and downs of life that I was talking about. And he knows what's the best. If we'll just listen to him. How many times growing up did we like not listen to our parents? You know, our parents, they knew what was best for us. Looking back, we know it, and we chose, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. All right? And what did it do? It usually turned out bad, or it did for me at least. I don't know about you guys. Well, that's the same thing. Like God really actually does know what's best for us. Every, every time. My parents, may, they may have gotten it wrong one, once or twice, right? But, but God always knows what's best. We'll listen to him. He provides for our needs. Right? He shapes us and he disciplines us like a good father disciplines when we go get off track. Right? He, his discipline is love towards us. And it makes him happy to do these things in our life because he delights in us as his people. He bought us for a, a heavy price of his son. He wants us to, to know him and to experience that life with God. And look, no one forced God to begrudgingly take you in. And sometimes you watch these movies and like uh, there's an orphan wandering the street and like this family sees them there and they just like, well, I guess I better take them in, right? Because they're gonna, they're, something bad is going to happen if I don't. Well, that's not what you know, God did at all. Right? There was no one forcing him to do it. He freely chose Take us in when he had no reason to. And that's, that's what God did for you if you are a Christian. No amount of good deeds or determination could ever get us into God's family. Like, we couldn't do it. And yet we are his because he made us his. He chose to do that. He bought us when we turned away from him. Uh, we see that in Ephesians. That he, in Christ, he adopted us. He predestined, predestined us to be adopted as his sons before the foundation of the world. Right? God chose to do it. Nobody made him do it. And that made our adoption possible by giving his son. And he made it possible by giving his son to take our place. Right? God made your sonhood, your daughterhood to him possible because he sent Jesus to pay the debt that kept us from him. It's like he, we're over here and he actually bought us to be a part of his family. Like God paid for us to be in his family. Imagine paying a hundred million dollars to bring somebody into your family. That's a lot of money, right? Well, God spent an infinite amount of his currency to bring us into his family because he loves us that much. Look, our sin had earned nothing but death, but the penalty of sin is death and hell. And Jesus took all our death, all our hell on himself. To pay for us, to buy us, so that we can know God. He conquered it all so that we would get what we don't deserve. And that's what we call grace. That's what we call an undeserved gift. So let's live with that reality. But God is your father. He loves you. He loves you. You are his son. You are his daughter. Know him as your father. Invest in that relationship. So today, I just want us to look at our lives. Right? Look at Jesus' life as a boy. He was growing up. right? He knew who he was. He knew that his identity was a son of God, the perfect son of God. Do you know your identity? Do you know who God has made you to be? 
as his son, as his daughter? Is that what your life looks like? Are you living out that identity, growing in his grace, knowing how his grace is overcoming every disappointment, every sin, every struggle in your life? He's doing, he wants to do that. He wants to shape you that way. Are you, is your identity being shaped by this growing desire to know God and to obey him? Is your identity being shaped as God is my father more than anything else? God is the one I want to know and obey, follow, and let him lead me. Right? He wants you to know him intimately. If you don't know him, today is a day you can start knowing him simply by trusting in Christ. If you do know him, God wants you to know him more. Right? Don't be satisfied with where you are. God has more for you. And all this is possible because when Jesus came, when Jesus grew, he modeled for us what he does in us when we follow him. He gives his life for us. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that we can learn so much simply by looking at how Jesus grew and how he wanted to follow you. As the perfect man, he is our example, yes. But as our Savior, he is the power behind living that out. And so, God, I pray that we would know him. And that as we know him, that we would live out the life that Jesus lived. Because that would be our heart. That would be our desire. And we would know that it is worthwhile. And so, God, we just pray that you would do this in us today. And it's in Jesus' name.